Hello everyone, it's time for Good Week Israel, where we will give you ILTV's latest positive highlights, so get ready to smile, because coming up, an amazing medical breakthrough you just have to see to believe. Researchers from Tel Aviv University unveiling what may be the future of personalized care. Archaeologists revealing incredible insights into European Jewry from before the time of the Holocaust. And finally, IDC finally receives official university status by Israel's Council for Higher Education. Now, COVID may be in the headlines, but it's far from the only disease for which incredible and recent advances have been made. Scientists at Tel Aviv University are now publishing amazing progress with brain cancer. Hannah Rifkin with the report. An historic moment in the fight against cancer. Israeli researchers have now found a way to use patients' own cells in a form of 3D printing material. And they use this biomaterial to make a model of the patient's tumors in which doctors can test the efficacy of potential treatments before trying them out for real in the body. And to complicate things further, the scientists from Tel Aviv University focusing on glioblastoma, or the most common form of brain cancer in adults. A cancer which is also among the most aggressive, carrying with it a very poor prognosis. The authors of the study, published in the Journal of Science Advances, explain that current tumor and cancer models just didn't do the job. One thing that we identified was that the models are incorrect. The models we are using for decades are of only cancer cells on a petri dish that is made of rigid plastic that doesn't have any resemblance to the brain of the patient or of, the, of people in general. And what we wanted to create is a 3D as opposed to two-dimensional plate where we grow the cells in a gel that mimics the tissue of the brain much more accurately, and hence this translates to the behavior of the cancer cells. Meanwhile, contributing to the model's realism, we added other cell types that are the environment of the brain, those resident cells in the brain, like immune cells and other cells that usually sit on the, in the brain, and blood vessels, functional blood vessels that we can flow through them, drugs and immune cells, red and white blood cells of the same patient. Finally, once printed, the researchers pump the imitation tumor with the patient's blood, followed by the potential treatment. And a treatment is deemed promising if either the printed tumor shrinks or if metabolic activity is lowered against control groups. Ofra Benny, who leads similar research at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, calling the study a potential game changer in the field of personalized medicine. All right, Israel now welcoming its first ever private university, the Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya. And this as the IDC finally receives official university status by Israel's Council for Higher Education, 27 years after its founding. But ILTV's Asaf Nisan has all the details. The Interdisciplinary Center in Herzliya, or IDC in short, has been known as one of the most prestigious private colleges in the state of Israel. Established in 1994, with high-end facilities, top-of-the-line teachers, and an academic level that is equal to that of the Ivy League schools in the U.S. But now, the school is about to go to the next level. Israel's Council for Higher Education, headed by Education Minister Yifat Shabiton, has officially approved its status as a university. It feels like uh, modern-day Zionism is being created here at IDC Herzliya by our being declared Israel's first private and non-profit university. The university, which will be called Reichman University, will be the first private university in the state of Israel and will be named after the founder and the president of the IDC, Professor Uriel Reichman. This has been the vision and dream of Professor Reichman for the last uh, 27 years fighting bureaucracy, um, and basically it's a dream come true. Uh, this university was founded uh, with a mission statement of Zionism. The university was actually created in order to create new leadership for the state of Israel, for the Jewish world and the world at large. From day one he saw it as a university. That was the goal that he said to himself. And according to former education minister Amnon Rubinstein, Israel will join the countries that have excellent private elite institutions. We're talking about a 
אנחנו מדברים על מוסד אקדמי שבסוף כשמקלפים את הכל מגיע לו לקבל את ההכרה כאוניברסיטה. But not everyone is happy about this change, as some voices have called out against this decision, since a private university might create new classes in society, where only the rich and, and well-connected may be able to afford learning there. So when you walk in the campus of IDC, you see a very good mixture of uh, Israelis and uh, international students. And the common denominator is the passion. It's the passion to learn, it's the passion to innovate, it's the passion to be actually a, a leading uh, uh, star uh, for the Israeli academia. There has been so many efforts by the uh, public universities to prevent us becoming a university, and I think we have shown them that uh, just it has been done today. But despite it all, IDC has finally reached their goal and became a university. thus finally competing with the other universities in Israel, saving one difference. IDC will still continue to be a private school without any need for government funding. We never asked for a penny from the Israeli government. And everything you see here in front of you is something which we created ourselves without taking any tax dollars uh, from the state of Israel, tax shekels from the state of Israel. Okay, and it's uh, very, very fulfilling. We have the largest international school in the country. I'm privileged to be the head of it. It's tremendously satisfying that all of these students who came to study here in a college can now put on their CV that, they're graduate, that they graduated a university and not a college. And it's uh, been a long time coming. Just like in the 1980s, we privatized the Israeli telephone company. And instead of taking eight years to get a telephone, it took eight minutes. Asaf Nisan, ILTV News. All right, our pasts and our futures meeting up in lower Earth orbit. This as Eitan Stibe, Israel's second ever astronaut to be, now planning to take a nearly 2,000-year-old Jewish coin into space with him. Elias Cosido, head of the Israel Antiquities Authority, presented Stibe with the coin in Jerusalem. But before that, the coin was discovered fairly recently in the so-called Cave of Horrors, and it dates back to the year two of the Bar Kokhba revolt against the Romans. the second Jewish revolt against the Romans, which took place around 133 in the Common Era, or 1900 years ago. Additionally, the coin bears the name of the Jewish rebel leader, Prince Shimon Bar Kokhba. Of course, the coin is not the only piece of Israel set to accompany Stibay to the International Space Station. Stibay is saying that he'll be taking, quote, a bag filled with items that have special significance to him, at least one of which had to be, apparently, a symbol of Jewish history and connection to the land. Finally, Stibbe is slated to fly to the ISS January 2022 aboard the SpaceX Axiom Space One rocket. Now, as the Jewish high holidays begin, thousands of worshippers are expected to visit the Western Wall Plaza in Jerusalem. So the Health Ministry and the Western Wall Heritage Foundation are partnering to prepare the space for safely handling the crowds. Hannah Rifkin, again with the details. As we are every year, אנחנו גם השנה הזאת, ערב ראש השנה תשפ"ב, הם מפנים את הפתקים מנדבחי הכותל המערבי. יש כאן פתקים מכל העולם. Twice a year, every year, for at least the last three centuries, a rabbi with the Western Wall Heritage Foundation arrives with a team of cleaners to clear out thousands of prayer notes from between the cracks of the stones at the holy site. And assuming the notes bear the name of God in writing, they are buried atop the Mount of Olives. But that's not the only annual tradition now beginning. It's just the only tradition seemingly unaffected by coronavirus. Every year, as the summer ends, hundreds of thousands of Jews arrive to pray at the Western Wall. The visitors asking God and their community members for forgiveness, or slichot, before Rosh Hashanah, or the Jewish New Year, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So, to prevent the events from becoming COVID super spreader incidents, Israeli authorities taking preemptive action. Starting Thursday, August 26, the Western Wall Plaza will be divided into prayer capsules, with separation barriers being erected. Entry will also only be limited to 10,000 worshippers at a time, and all visitors will be required to wear masks and adhere to instructions from ushers. Perhaps most importantly, though, the Western Wall Heritage Foundation asking visitors to arrive early in the evenings for services and to try to come in the earlier days of the Selichot period itself, rather than overcrowding the holy site at the last minute before the holidays. If overcrowding becomes an issue, entry will be closed. 
Then finally, for those who can't make it, Slichot services will be live streamed at thekotel.org every midnight on the following days until the eve of Yom Kippur, September 14th. Chana Rifkin, ILTV. In other news, we head back in time now to Lithuania of old. Excavation teams uncovering incredible artifacts from the great synagogue of Vilna. And for the first time since the synagogue was destroyed by both the Nazis and then the Soviets over 60 years ago. The Israeli-Lithuanian excavation expedition, waking the world over the weekend with new evidence of the centuries-old Jewish life from Vilna, Lithuania. And the excavations focused on none other than the great synagogue complex of Vilna, also known as the Shulchoif, which at one point boasted 12 synagogues and prayer halls, a community council building, kosher meat stalls, a seminary, a very famous library, and more. Nearly all of it destroyed, though, looted and burned by the Nazis during the Holocaust. And then in 1956-57, the Soviets demolished what remained, making way for a modern school that's since been built on the campus. Still history finding a way to reveal itself. Archaeologists now exposing remnants of the Arona Kodesh, or the Torah Ark, and the Bima, or the altar from the Great Synagogue of Vilna, for the first time since the Holocaust. And that's not all. Most recently, a silver yad, or hand-shaped pointer used to read from the Torah, was found over the weekend. Also, two impressive staircases seen in images of the synagogue from before its destruction were discovered. The entire facade of the altar has been completely excavated, and one of the four massive pillars that supported the roof has been exposed. The Great Synagogue of Vilna was built in the 17th century in the Renaissance Baroque style, and it stood for roughly 350 years before its erasure. Now there are dozens of ways to make meatballs, maybe even hundreds. But leave it to Danielle from kosher.com to bring all of the flavor. Learn how to make this Italian style, family style masterpiece. Good no everybody and welcome back to kosher.com. Today we are going all the way to Italia. We are making old school, really yummy, basic, delicious Italian meatballs. difference about our Italian meatballs? Well, they're super basic, they have very few simple clean ingredients, and instead of the usual making the meatballs and throwing them into a pot of sauce, we're going to bake them first so they get a really nice crispy outside, and then when they go into the sauce, they're going to soak up all of that deep red dark flavor, and it's going to be so yummy. First things first, we have our protein. For this mixture, we are using chopped beef and chopped veal. Why the combination? It just gives the most flavorful, tender meatballs possible. If you want, you could go all beef, you could go all veal, you could sub in a little turkey, but for the most authentic Italiano flavor, you wanna mix the two. And then it's just a few simple ingredients. We have some lightly beaten egg, I like to get that beaten before I mix it in, even though it is really super easy to just crack it right in and then mix it with your hands as you're mixing, but it will increase the texture of your meatballs if you beat it first to get the whites and the yellows fully incorporated into each other. We have lots of chopped garlic. Get all of that in there. We need all that garlic flavor. Next up, we have some unseasoned panko breadcrumbs. If we were going super traditional, we would be using white bread soaked in milk to add moisture, but 
that's just a lot of work. And panko has a lot of clean flavor. You know what, let me show you what I'm using. I'm using these. They're unseasoned panko. We don't want any seasoning in them because we want to control what goes into our meatballs. They're delicious. It's just gonna help tighten and hold everything together when we form our meatballs. Chopped parsley. Get all that in there. Salt, because salt. And pepper. And now all we have to do is get this mixed up. This was so few ingredients, it took two seconds to make. It's really just a matter of going to the store and picking up your meat or defrosting it. You really have everything in your house ready. All right, now we're gonna get this meat mixed up. Here's the thing, you don't wanna overwork the meat or it will toughen. So you wanna just mix until everything is incorporated, making sure that the veal and the beef are mixed into each other, but you don't wanna overdo it. We don't wanna play with our food here, even though it's tempting, because it has a super fun texture. Once your meat mixture comes together, you are going to take a sheet pan. No parchment, please. You will get such a better crust on these without the parchment. A quick sprinkling of baking spray and form our meatballs. There's only a few things you really need to know when forming your meatballs. There's only one thing, really. You don't want to overwork them. It's okay if they have rough edges. They don't need to be perfectly circular, but you really don't want to squeeze them and pack them too tight or that will make a denser meatball. You want a light, airy meatball. You don't want to feel like you're eating a golf ball just look like a golf ball, not taste like one. Keep in mind that they're gonna shrink as they cook a little bit, so you can make them a little bit bigger than you want them. All right, we're gonna get this pan into the oven and then we're just gonna continue rolling. While the meatballs are in the oven, we're gonna start on our sauce. It's very simple, very quick, very easy. We're going to preheat our pot on medium-high heat, add a little bit of olive oil, Get our onions in there. And start getting just a little bit of sweetness out of those onions. We don't need to brown them. We're just looking for a nice translucent color. Gonna add a pinch of salt to help our onions along. Once your onions lose a little bit of that white opaqueness, we're gonna go ahead and add in our garlic. And we're just gonna cook this until the garlic becomes fragrant and you start to smell it, just for a minute or so. And now it's time to add in the component that really makes this sauce super deep, rich, and flavorful, our red wine. I love that sound and the smell of the red wine hitting the bottom of the pot mixing together with the garlic and onion. It smells like Italy. It's so good and so rich and so delicious. We just wanna cook the wine down for about a minute or so until it loses a lot of its alcohol-y flavor. And then we can continue. We're gonna go ahead and continue building our sauce. We have two bay leaves here. Add those right in. Two cans of tomato sauce. I prefer this in a can with no flavorings, no oregano, no carrot pieces, onion chunks, anything. We can flavor our own food here. Add it right in. Get the other can in here. And now we're just gonna fill up one of these cans with water and add that to the pot. Add in your water. Season our sauce with salt and pepper. And just give it a stir. Once this comes to a boil, you can reduce the heat and let it simmer until all your meatballs are ready, and then we'll continue. All right, we got our meatballs out of the oven. Do you see how beautiful and crispy and delicious that is? That is what we wanted. All the natural sugars in the meat caramelized and created such a good texture, but the inside is still soft and juicy and delicious. All right, we're gonna pour these meatballs right in along with any of the meat juices that accumulated in the pan. That's just gonna help the sauce feel even meatier and more delicious. See those goodness? Get those, scrape those off the pan, get those into your sauce. That is flavor. Yes. Once the meatballs and the tomato sauce come up to a boil, reduce the heat and let these simmer. These can go for as little as half an hour or even up to two hours. Actually, even better, 
pop them in the fridge and serve them the next day for dinner, they only get better after they're refrigerated. I am sending you the smell through the screen. It is intoxicating. The meat, the wine, the tomato, the bay leaf, you get it all and it is, you could eat the air. It is that good. You could just take a bite right out of the air. It smells so good. All right, we're gonna get this plated up. Personally, we love angel hair in my house. It's our spaghetti of choice, but use whatever you want. Use penne, use bow ties, use couscous, use rice. Put it on sandwiches. Yum. Let's get this plated up. Oh my gosh. I like to serve this big old family style because they're meatballs. Make sure to get all that extra sauce right over the top so the spaghetti can soak it all up. And that's it. You can totally go ahead and garnish this with some freshly chopped parsley. I'm just gonna dig right in because it's a dinner. Get some meatballs in here. Make sure to top it with plenty of meatballs. Yum, yum, yum. And time to dig in. Oh my gosh, I am so excited for this. You gotta get a good fork full. What? <laughs> like I said, family style. Anything goes. How is it, right? Mm -hmm. You get that good crunch on the answer? Mm -hmm. Bye, Eric. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Look at that bite. Got a little bit of meatball, got spaghetti. Here we go. It's so good. The texture of the meat, the flavors of the sauce, the spaghetti to soak it all up. These are the best meatballs ever. I really hope you guys try these out. For this recipe and more delicious recipes, head on over to kosher.com. We'll see you next time. Bye guys. And that's all for today's Good Week Israel. I hope that we've helped you start your week off with a smile. I'm Aaron Porras. See you next week.